In this two hour English lesson, you are going to learn all the vocabulary you need to get your English to that C1 level, that advanced level. So if right now you're about here, maybe at the B level, don't worry because by the end of this lesson, you're going to reach the C1 level. Welcome back to j 4 is English. I'm Jennifer. Now let's get started. First, I have a reading exercise. We're going to read a news article together and you're going to learn a lot of advanced vocabulary, but you'll also learn advanced grammar and correct pronunciation. So let's review that article now. Let me read the headline. Canada's population surpasses 40 million. Surpasses, this means more than. Another word is exceed. So right now, Canada has more than 40 million people. Exceed is another way of saying it. So in this case, because it is in the present simple, exceeds, surpasses, I'll put exceeds with an S. What's the population of your country? Most likely it's more than 40 million because Canada has a very small population. So share what your country is and its population in the comments. They will be really interesting. Now, I'm Canadian, if you didn't know. And interestingly, I had no idea that Canada's population surpassed 40 million. A student shared the news with me. So thank you to that student. And now I'm reviewing the article with everyone. Let's continue on. Statistics Canada has a population clock. So this here looks like it is the population clock which estimates Canada's population in real time based on a number of factors. So in real time, that means as it's happening. So on Saturday at 2.34 p.m., it will have the data for Canada's population. And this number is always increasing or even potentially it could decrease as well. A population can go down. So that means in real time as it's happening, as it's happening based on a number of factors. And then they list the factors like recent trends for births. That's one factor, deaths and migration data. Let's talk about migration. I have a lot of students who ask and native speakers who ask, what's the difference between migration and immigration? So first let's talk about immigration, the term you're probably more familiar with. Immigration is the concept of permanently moving to a foreign country. Now, migration simply means moving. So the difference really is the fact that immigration sounds more permanent, where migration, it could be someone coming to Canada to study, and they're only going to stay for their education and then they plan to go back or they're only in Canada temporarily and then they plan to go back. So there's less of an emphasis on permanency. So that's the main difference here. Migration data. So it's saying that this total, it represents people who are in the country even on a temporary reason for example, studying for a one year diploma, they're still counted in this total. The clock hit 40 million just before 3 p.m. on Friday, June 16th. Let's talk about the verb hit. This is one of those verbs that is widely used in English and has many different meanings depend on how it's used. Of course, there's the more literal definition of hit, which is this <laughs> hit in this context, that's not what it means. When you hit something in this case, it means you reach a target and 40 million is the target. So hit simply means reach, but when you use it, oh, we hit 40 million. It sounds like more of an accomplishment, whereas reach doesn't have that sense of accomplishment. So for example, in a company, they might say, 
we hit our sales goal for this year and it's only July. So it's only halfway through the year, but they hit their sales goal. They reached it. They achieved it. So that's how you can use hit as well. And remember that hit in the past form is still hit. Yesterday, we hit our sales goal. I created a free lesson PDF that summarizes everything from this lesson. So you can look in the description for the link to download that. Let's continue. This is an exciting milestone for Canada. A milestone is an important accomplishment for a person, a company, a country, a group. An important accomplishment. So for you, you might say graduating from university was a major milestone in my life or having a child, getting married, buying my first house, finding my first job. Notice how I started all of those examples in the gerund. Finding my first job. So finding my first job or the love of my life was because the action has already been completed was a major you don't have to say major you could just say milestone was a major milestone in my life this is a great sentence for you to practice so why don't you do that right now what was a major milestone in your life share that in the comments and put your verb in the ing in the gerund form so Put that in the comments to practice that. And I'm excited to find out what your major milestone was. It is a strong signal that Canada remains a dynamic and welcoming country. Dynamic is a great adjective to add to your vocabulary. And it means having a lot of ideas and enthusiasm. So Canada remains a dynamic country. So notice we're using dynamic as an adjective to describe what type of country Canada is. So you could use this for your company, your school, your organization. I work in a dynamic company, for example. Full of potential, said chief statistician Anil Arora in a media statement. Let's take a look at this. Could be a difficult word to pronounce, statistician, statistician. So notice how I connect this, statistician, st, statistician, statistician, statistician. Try it, statistician. Okay, you can practice that. Chief statistician. So a statistician is someone who analyzes statistics. And by saying chief, it means they are the the main statistician, the most important, the highest rank, the highest ranking statistician. So I'll put that highest, highest rank. Canada's population growth rate currently stands at 2.7%. So the growth rate means every year Canada's population increases by 2.7% which is the highest annual growth rate since 1957, when Canada was experiencing its post-war baby boom. Now this, you may be familiar with the term baby boomers. Baby boomers, this describes a generation and it's the generation that was born right after the war. And that generation is my parents' generation. So generally people in their 60s, 70s, 60s and 70s, I believe, would be considered baby boomers. And I'm not sure if this is happening in your country, but in Canada right now, all the baby boomers are retiring. This massive amount of people are exiting the workforce right now. So it's a very interesting time in the economy baby boomers is that 
a term that you're familiar with in your country? Is there a large population that resulted after the war? Share that in the comments as well. I'd be interested to know. Canada's population reached 30 million in 1997 and could reach 50 million as early as 2043 if the current trend continues. Canada's population reached 30 million. Now, remember, we could say hit 30 million because generally numbers that end in zero or five are considered the major accomplishments, the milestones. So we could use our other verb we learned, hit. And remember, this is the past form as well. So although we have reached with an ED, it's just hit. Canada's population reached 30 million which was an important milestone in 1997 and could reach 50 million as early as 2043. Now notice here they used the modal could, could reach. First of all, remember that after a modal verb, you only use the base form. So modal plus base, so no to reach, could to reach, no. Modal plus base, always. And this is because it's a potential. The possibility exists, but that doesn't mean it actually will happen. So the potential is there, but it's not guaranteeing anything, potential. So this is, if you understand how this is used, we use this a lot to say something like, I could help you. I could help you move this weekend. So I'm saying the potential is there. My schedule is open. I'm available, but I'm not going to. <laughs> now, this isn't a very nice thing to say to someone, but we use this as a little bit of a joke. Oh, I could help you, but I'm not going to. Just kidding. Of course, I'll help you move this weekend. So that's a fun way, you, if you know the how to properly use could, you can make a little joke like this. You probably don't want to say that to your boss, though. <laughs> I'll leave that to your discretion. As early as, they're saying 2043 is the earliest time that this could happen, but it could also happen later. So they're using as early as just to state the earliest time, not that other times aren't possible. For example, if you're planning a wedding, a party, or even a conference, you could say guests will arrive as early as three o'clock p.m. So this doesn't mean that every guest will arrive at three. This is just the earliest time they'll arrive. Of course, it's possible for them to arrive at 3.30, 4 o'clock, even 5 o'clock if they're extremely late. But this is the earliest time, as early as. So for deadlines, you can use this. You might say, I can get you the report as early as 9 a.m. Or you could put Saturday. Why would you submit a report on Saturday? Tuesday. Now you're letting your boss know or your coworker know this is the earliest time, but it may be later than that. Okay, let's continue on. Last year, Canada's population increased by a record of 1.05 million people. You could put 1.05, 1.05, both of those for pronouncing it are fine. Zero, O, zero, O, 1.05 million people. And I haven't mentioned this, but remember that we don't put an S on million. I hear students say this a lot. Oh, there are one millions in my country. No, you don't say that. It's one million. But what do you notice about this? A lot of students forget that people is plural. It's an irregular plural. So there's no S on it, but it is plural because what's the singular of people? Person. One person to people. So the S is on the noun, not the number. That's why we say, I 
made three billion dollars last year. Cha-ching. So here you put it on the noun dollars, or you could say I made three million posters. <laughs> That's a lot of posters. So you put the S on the noun. You don't put an S on here. 300, 3,000, 3 million, 3 billion, singular, posters, plural. Statistics Canada reported that 96% of that increase was due to international migration. So notice how here they put in brackets permanent and temporary. It would have been useful if they put that at the very top when we were talking about migration, so you knew. But if you understand the word migration, you know that it means both permanent and temporary because remember, that's how I explain the difference to you. So just moving. So I'll add that moving permanently or temporarily for migration and immigration. It implies permanent. You want to stay in that country permanently. Let's get back to it. In 2022, Canada welcomed 437,000. Okay. 437. When I see three zeros, I know that the number before is thousand. 400, 37. You don't have to say 437. It's not necessary. 437,180. And remember, the S goes on the noun, immigrants, into the country, reflecting Canada's high immigration targets. Now, because this is a target, remember, when you're talking about reaching or achieving that, you can use the verb hit. We hit our target. We hit our target, which means you reached or achieved that target. Immigration is one of the main way, uh-oh. Immigration is one of the main way the country. Does that sound weird to you? Immigration is one of the main way the country deals. Something's wrong with this. There's a typo or a minor grammar mistake because this has to say way. It's not optional. Right now, this article has a typo, which means there's a grammar mistake in the article. It has to be ways, okay? Now, this sometimes confuses students because you have one of. When you have one of, it means you're selecting one from a group. So the noun that comes next has to be plural because one of, okay? Here's an easy example. One of, so my noun has to be plural. Flavors, flavors. One of my favorite flavors of ice cream is, we use is because is matches one. One is. And then you provide one option. So I wouldn't list two or three flavors. I only list one, mint chocolate chip. What is one of your favorite flavors of ice cream? So this implies I have other favorite flavors and I'm just sharing one. So share that in the comments. What is one of your favorite flavors of ice cream? And practice this and make sure you get that S. And I'll cross this out so you know it was a mistake. Immigration is one of the main ways the country deals with its demographic challenges. Canada has an aging population. Remember, I shared that the baby boomers, they're all becoming 60, 70. They're exiting the workforce. They're aging, becoming older. So that's aging, becoming older, becoming older. Now, technically we're all aging. <laughs> we're all becoming older. Canada has an aging population and the natural birth rate is not high enough to grow the population itself. By having natural birth rate, they mean the birth rate of Canadians, of people in Canada. And they included that because it relates to the next sentence. As a result, Canada needs immigrants. We need people from other countries, maybe you, to come to Canada permanently. 
to help maintain and grow the country's workforce. Because remember I said the baby boomers are exiting the workforce because they're all 60, 70 years old. They're ready to retire. So again, if you haven't shared in the comments, I would be very interested to know if this is a situation that your country is dealing with as well. Immigration accounts for almost 100% of Canada's labor force growth. Wow. 100% almost. That's quite a staggering statistic. According to Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada, this is just the name of a government department. By 2023, immigrants are projected to be about 30% of Canada's population. So projected, this means calculated based on information already known. So you could say estimated, but when you say estimated, it sounds more of a guess because when you estimate something, you don't actually have the information. But when you project something, it's more based on looking at the information and then making a prediction based on that information. So it sounds more accurate to me than estimated. Immigrants are projected to be about 30% of Canada's population. Now, one other thing I noticed about the article is that they said by 2023. This seems odd to me. Does it seem odd to you or do you know why it seems odd to me? This is a new article. This article is from June 2023. But if you say by 2023, you're saying 2023 is the deadline. But 2023 starts January 1st. And we are in June, which is already several months. But they're saying it is projected to happen by a deadline that's technically in the past. So that to me doesn't make sense. I wonder if 2023 is a typo and maybe they meant to say 2025 or a date in the future because we can't use by with a timeline in the past. And when this article was written in June 2023, this was already in the past. Another way to correct this mistake is to say by the end of 2023, because now the deadline is December 2023, which is in the future. But by 2023 means January 2023, which is currently in the past. And it does not make sense to me to say by and a past date. If you're talking about a future projection. Again, the final way is you could say by 2025 and have a date in the future. So that's how I would correct this as well. And that's the end of the article. And what I'll do now is I'll go to the top and I'll read the article from start to finish. And this time you can focus on my pronunciation. Canada's population surpasses 40 million. Statistics Canada has a population clock, which estimates Canada's population in real time based on a number of factors like recent trends for births, deaths, and immigration data. The clock hit 40 million just before 3 p.m. on Friday, June 16th. This is an exciting milestone for Canada. It is a strong signal that Canada remains a dynamic and welcoming country, full of potential, said Chief Statistician Anil Arora in a media statement. Canada's population growth rate currently stands at 2.7%, which is the highest annual growth rate since 1957 when Canada was experiencing its post-war baby boom. Canada's population reached 30 million in 1997 and could reach 50 million as early as 2043 if the current trends continue, according to Statistics Canada. 
Last year, Canada's population increased by a record of 1.05 million people. Statistics Canada reported that 96% of that increase was due to international, permanent and temporary migration. In 2022, Canada welcomed 437,180 immigrants into the country, reflecting Canada's high immigration targets. Immigration is one of the main ways the country deals with its demographic challenges. Canada has an aging population and the natural birth rate is not high enough to grow the population itself. As a result, Canada needs immigrants to help maintain and grow the country's workforce. Immigration accounts for almost 100% of Canada's labor force growth according to Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada. By 2023, immigrants are projected to be about 30% of Canada's population. First, I'll read the headline, Is the Coliseum Crumbling? I'm sure you recognize the Coliseum in this picture, a monument that is known around the world. Is the Colosseum crumbling? Let's talk about crumbling. The verb is to crumble, crumble. And that means to break one item, one thing into smaller pieces. So this is commonly used with homes or structures or building, especially when they're made of a material that can break into smaller pieces like stone, like the Colosseum. Now, this is also commonly used in cooking. So my example here, we crumbled some nuts over the pie. So you take one whole nut, even though a nut is very small, and then you break it into smaller pieces, and then you can crumble it over the pie. So you have small pieces of nuts on your pie. So very common in cooking and also very common for buildings, especially stone buildings. And here it's in the present continuous. Is the Colosseum crumbling? So our verb to be is simply because they're asking if this is taking place right now. Now notice the Colosseum. For the name of this monument, this structure, you need the article the because there is only one Colosseum. It is unique, the, and Colosseum is capitalized. You can't tell here because every first letter is capitalized in the title, but Colosseum is always spelled with a capital C. So the, which does not have to be capitalized, but Colosseum, the C is always capitalized because it's considered a proper noun. And we use the because it's unique. There's only one. Don't worry about taking these notes because I summarize everything in a free lesson PDF. So you can look for the link in the description. I chose this article because I am going to Rome next week. And the first thing I'm doing in Rome is going to the Colosseum. I already have my ticket booked. So you can write in the comments, have a great trip, Jennifer. We also simply borrow the French expression, bon voyage, very commonly said bon voyage, which means have a great trip. So you can say, have a great trip, Jennifer, or you can borrow the French expression and say bon voyage. I probably should know the Italian expression for that, but I unfortunately don't know it. So if you know the Italian expression, put it in the comments as well. And don't worry, I will share lots of pictures and videos as well of the Colosseum so you can experience the trip with me. Let's continue with the article and learn more about the Colosseum. The Colosseum, so here notice capital C. In this case, the T is capitalized because it starts a sentence. And we always capitalize the first letter that starts a new sentence, just like this is capitalized, this is capitalized. So that's why the T is capitalized, but the C is always capitalized. Colosseum. The Colosseum is a giant amphitheater. Don't let this long word confuse you. This pronunciation is very simple. Just say the word theater, which you already know how to pronounce theater, 
theater. Now for this, ampa, pa, pa. So don't let this spelling confuse you. Pa, pa, ampa, ampa. Now the syllable stress is on the first syllable. So let's combine the sounds together and we'll emphasize the first syllable. Amphitheater, amphitheater. Very simple, right? I wrote the phonetic spelling here for you. Now, giant, of course you know this word. Giant means very large, but did you know that a synonym of giant, very large, is colossal? Colossal. So you could say the Colosseum is a colossal amphitheater because they look very similar. So I think that's a nice pair to combine. In the center of Rome, Italy. It is one of the world's most iconic sites. Listen to the pronunciation here. Iconic. 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 So we pronounce this as an I sound. Iconic. And the syllable stress is in the middle. Iconic sites. Now, because we have a superlative statement, one of the most iconic sites. So it isn't the most iconic site. It's one of, but we still have our superlative. So we need the, the most iconic sites, the world's most iconic sites, and one of the new seven wonders of the world. Coming back to iconic, of course, this means very famous or very popular. Now, I gave an example sentence here, one of the most iconic sites. Now, notice you have to have plural for your noun, sites, in Ottawa is, but your verb is conjugated with one, which means there's only one, right? So you need your singular verb to be. One of the most iconic sites, plural, in Ottawa, this is the city I live in, is your verb to be conjugated with the subject one, which is singular, is, and then you can name that one of the most iconic sites, is Parliament Hill. So I want you to practice this in the comments. Of course, instead of Ottawa, you're going to put the name of your city, and then you can only choose one. So choose whatever, in your opinion, is the most famous or the most popular. So put that in the comments. I think it will be really interesting to learn about these iconic sites around the world. Let's continue. The Colosseum is the largest ancient, notice the pronunciation, ancient, ch, chint, ancient, ancient. And it's a very nasal A sound, A, A, ancient, ancient. The largest ancient, now you know how to say this, right? What is it? Amphitheater, amphitheater. Is the largest ancient amphitheater ever built. So here again, we have the largest because it's the superlative, the largest ancient amphitheater ever built. It was completed. It, of course, the Colosseum, it was completed over two millennia ago in AD 80. Let's talk about millennia. Millennia is the plural form of millennium. One millennium two millennia. And one millennium is 1,000 years. So two millennia, remember plural of millennium, two millennia is 2,000 years. So it was completed over 2,000 years ago in AD 80. To be honest, I can't even imagine that long ago in the past. I don't know about you. Now, AD Perhaps you're familiar with this. This is a calendar reference. I'm not sure if this calendar reference is used all around the world. So let me know in the comments if you're familiar with this calendar reference. I personally did not know what AD stood for. So I Googled it and it stands for 
Anno Domini, sorry if I pronounced that wrong. This is a Latin phrase meaning in the year of the Lord, which is used when referring to a year after Jesus Christ was born. Now, you may also be familiar with seeing a time reference BC. BC, that means before Christ. So BC is before Christ and AD is basically after Christ was born. Ultimately, a very long time ago. It is the place where gladiators fought during the time of the Roman Empire. Notice this, empire, pyre, empire. Are you enjoying this lesson? If you are, then I want to tell you about the Finally Fluent Academy. This is my premium training program where we study native English speakers from TV, the movies, YouTube, and the news so you can improve your listening skills of fast English, expand your vocabulary with natural expressions, and learn advanced grammar easily. Plus, you'll have me as your personal coach. You can look in the description for the link to learn more, or you can go to my website and click on Finally Fluent Academy. Now let's continue with our lesson. The Colosseum is huge. Remember before it was giant is giant. And what was the adjective that I taught you as well? The Colosseum is colossal, colossal. Not that you have to use that. So we have giant, huge, colossal. Those are all alternatives to very large. The Colosseum is huge. It could seat 50,000 people. It covers around six acres of land and is 620 feet long, 512 feet feet wide and 158 feet tall. Notice how I read those numbers, 620. You don't have to say 620. You can simply say 620, 512, 158 feet tall. It took more than 1.1 million tons. Notice here, I see this mistake a lot. Notice the S is not on millions, it's on tons. 1.1 million tons of concrete, stone, and bricks to complete the Colosseum. So here, this is where you finally see Colosseum not at the beginning of a sentence, because remember, at the beginning, the is capitalized simply because it starts the sentence, the T in the. But here, lowercase t, but we still need a capital C because Colosseum is always capitalized and you always need the article the, but the does not need to be capitalized. The Italian government is trying to figure out if there is any truth to reports that rock is falling from the Colosseum. Remember, this goes back to the headline of our article, which was, is the Colosseum crumbling? So we have the whole Colosseum, and if it's crumbling, it means it's breaking into smaller pieces. Well, how is that done? It is when, right here, rock or stone is falling from the Colosseum. So you could also say any truth to reports that the Colosseum is crumbling. Now here, trying to figure out. Figure out, this is a very useful phrasal verb, and you can think of it said another way, it would be, to determine is trying to determine. So trying to know if this is true, trying to figure out if there is any truth to reports that rock is falling from the Colosseum. Last week, some visitors to the Colosseum said they saw some bits. A bit is just a very, very small piece. So if I saw a bit of stone it is a very small amount of stone. And here it's plural. So they saw more than one. They saw maybe five or 10 bits. 
small pieces of stone. So last week, some visitors to the Colosseum said they saw some bits of stone fall from it. An Italian environmental group says that exhaust fumes, exhaust fumes, those are the fumes that are produced from a gas-powered vehicle. So you see the fumes coming out of the back of the vehicle. They're the dark cloud uh, behind some cars. So the, that would be the exhaust fumes and vibrations from cars. I wrote down what exhaust is for you and a nearby subway. So notice here, a nearby subway. Let's talk about nearby. Nearby means that it's not far away. Nearby can function as an adjective or an adverb depending on how it's used in the sentence. Is the Colosseum nearby? This could definitely be a question that I ask someone in Rome. Maybe I'm trying to find the Colosseum and I don't know if I'm in the right place. And I can say, oh, excuse me, is the Colosseum nearby? In this case, is it an adjective or an adverb? It's an adverb, an adverb, because it modifies is the Colosseum nearby. It's modifying the verb. Now, how about this one? Is there a cafe nearby? This could be another question I ask someone in Rome. Maybe I finally find the Colosseum, I tour it, and then I'm really hungry, but I don't want to walk very far. So I can say, oh, is there a cafe nearby? What's this? Adjective or adverb? It should be pretty easy. It's the exact same as the sentence above. <laughs> it even uses the same verb. So this is an adverb. How about this one? We had lunch at a nearby cafe. We had lunch at a nearby cafe. So I could be at the Coliseum. Remember, I'm tired. I don't want to walk very far. So I find a cafe nearby. And then later I tell someone, oh, we had lunch at a nearby cafe. Is this an adverb or adjective? In this case, it's an adjective because it describes the location of the noun. So in this case, nearby subway, it's an adjective. So you can use it as both the adverb, the adjective, very commonly used. And a nearby subway are, notice the verb are because we have multiple things, the exhaust fumes, the vibrations, and a nearby subway are causing damage to the Colosseum. This is what the environmental group thinks is causing the falling rock. The director of the Colosseum, again, the Colosseum, has denied these reports. If you deny something, you, you say, no, that isn't true. That isn't accurate. That isn't correct. That's how you deny it. So the director of the Colosseum has denied these reports of falling stones. Although she said that sometimes small stones, remember we could say bits of stone, but bits is very small. So if you just say small stone, it sounds like larger. And then a bit is just tiny, very small. Small stones have been known to fall from the ancient building due to rain, wind, or birds. So due to, this is the reason why. You could also say because of, because of rain, wind, or birds. Due to rain, wind, or birds. The outside of the Colosseum is made from travertine, travertine, tine, to be honest, I've never seen this word before. Perhaps if you are a builder or an architect, this is common for you. Is made from travertine, a type of limestone. So notice how they even, they put the definition of travertine, travertine, because it is not something that a native speaker would instantly know what it is. So they let me know, oh, it's a type of limestone. So now I understand what this is. If they didn't have a type of limestone, I would understand that it's some sort of building material because they said the Colosseum is made from. So I understand the context, but I wouldn't know exactly what it is. 
The Colosseum is made from travertine, a type of limestone. The interior is made from brick and tufa. I have no idea what tufa is, but it's a fun word to say, tufa. Another variety of limestone. So again, notice they did the same thing. They know that I would not know what tufa is as a native speaker because it's not very commonly used, but I do know what brick is. So they don't define what brick is, but they define what tufa is and travertine because those are not common words. Another variety of limestone. So I just learned two new words from this article. I learn new things. And I also learned what AD was because although I knew what the expression meant, I didn't know the actual name of it. I had no idea. No idea. All right. The tourist attraction, the Colosseum. So you can describe something as a tourist attraction. It's where tourists go. Tourists are attracted to certain locations. The tourist attraction is slated to get a $33 million facelift beginning in March. Now, face, of course, your face, right? So if I see facelift referring to a building, I know that work is going to be done on the exterior of the building. So you might say, oh, my house, my apartment, my condo, my home, whatever style of home you have, my house needs a facelift. By saying that, you're saying something on the outside of your house needs to be repaired. Maybe it's the paint, maybe it's the brick, the stone, the tufa, <laughs> uh, maybe it's the gutters, but something on the outside. It isn't on the inside, it's the outside. That would be a facelift. So something on, they're spending money on the outside of the Colosseum beginning in March. Now, when something is slated, let's talk about this. The sentence structure here is to be slated. Now we have to do something. So the infinitive to and then your verb or something can be slated for. And this simply means expected to happen or plan to happen. So the Coliseum getting a $33 million facelift in March is planned. It's expected to happen. So we can say it's slated. It is slated. Now, if you have a specific date, you can say whatever the thing is, the tour is slated for Wednesday. Okay, for Wednesday, for next March, for next year. But if you have a verb, you use to, to base verb, so the infinitive. To be slated infinitive or to be slated for and then a specific date. The Colosseum represents the power, brilliance, and brutality of the Roman Empire. That's a very powerful statement. I like this. Three things, the power, the brilliance. Brilliance, of course, is extremely smart, showing high intellect. Brilliance and brutality. Brutality is related to cruelty, punishment, death, which I'm sure you are well aware is what took place at the Colosseum. So the Colosseum represents the power, brilliance, and brutality of the Roman Empire. The sheer size of the Colosseum, its architectural design, and its function are still marvels to behold today. Let's take a look at sheer, the sheer size of the Colosseum. Sheer has no meaning on its own. It is only there to emphasize whatever comes next. So I could say the sheer power of the Roman Empire. I'm making power sound a lot stronger. The sheer brilliance of the gladiators. I'm emphasizing 
the brilliance, the sheer brutality of the Colosseum. I'm emphasizing the brutality. It has no meaning on its own. The sheer size of the Colosseum is architectural design and its function are still marvels to behold today. Let's talk about marvels. This is a noun and it's plural because they're talking about the size, the architectural design and the function. So there are three separate things and these are the marvels. Now the marvels or a marvel is simply something to admire. So we could say the, the sheer size, the design and its functions its function are something to admire or are things, because there are more than one, are things to admire, are marvels. So you can summarize that with just one word, are still marvels to behold today. When you behold something, it simply means you look at it. So that's it. To behold means to look at, to view, to, to see, to observe. So it has to be with your sight. And of course, that's what people do. They go to the Colosseum and they look at it. They observe it. They take pictures of it. So that's why they use to behold because it means with your eyes. However, what took place on stage, so on stage meaning at the Colosseum, it was considered a stage, right? Because it's a theater. People were sitting all around and then the floor of the Colosseum was the stage. What took place on stage with the systematic killing of hundreds of thousands of animals ugh, and people, ugh, this is the brutality, right? The brutality. Hundreds of thousands of animals and people bears a grim reminder. Let's talk about bears a grim reminder. If it bears a reminder, it means it represents that reminder. It holds it. It keeps it. And grim, grim is unpleasant. So when you look at the Colosseum as a tourist, you see, wow, this is an amazing architecture, design, but there's also a lot of brutality in that. And that is the grim reminder. And it reminds you of something unpleasant, bears a grim reminder of the violence and cruelty that is core to the history of the Colosseum and the Roman emperor. If something is core to something, so to be core to something else means it is the most important part. It You can't separate it. So you can't separate the violence and cruelty from the Roman Empire. It was the important part. It represented the Roman Empire. It's the core to the history of the Colosseum and the Roman Empire. And that's the end of the article. So unfortunately, we're ending on a very negative note here, remind, remembering the, the cruelty and brutality, but that's history, right? And all we can do is learn from those lessons and try to improve. And when I go to the Colosseum, I will bear these as a grim reminder, but I'll also admire the Colosseum for the architecture and the beauty that it represents at the same time. So a little bit of a, a contrast there, I'll say. So now what I'll do is I'll go to the top of the article and I'll read it from start to finish. And this time you can focus on my pronunciation. Is the Colosseum crumbling? The Colosseum is a giant amphitheater in the center of Rome, Italy. It is one of the world's most iconic sites and one of the new seven wonders of the world. The Colosseum is the largest ancient amphitheater ever built. It was completed over two millennia ago in AD 80. It is the place where gladiators fought during the time of the Roman Empire. The Colosseum is huge. It could seat 50,000 people. It covers around six acres of land and is 620 feet long, 512 feet wide, and 158 feet tall. 
It took more than 1.1 million tons of concrete, stone, and bricks to complete the Colosseum. The Italian government is trying to figure out if there is any truth to reports that rock is falling from the Colosseum. Last week, some visitors to the Colosseum said they saw some bits of stone fall from it. An Italian environmental group says that exhaust fumes and vibrations from cars and a nearby subway are causing damage to the Colosseum. The director of the Colosseum has denied these reports of falling stone, although she said that sometimes small stones have been known to fall from the ancient building due to rain, wind, or birds. The outside of the Colosseum is made from travertine, a type of limestone. The interior is made from brick and tufa, another variety of limestone. The tourist attraction is slated to get a $33 million facelift beginning in March. The Colosseum represents the power, brilliance, and brutality of the Roman Empire. The sheer size of the Colosseum, its architectural design, and its function are still marvels to behold today. However, what took place on stage with the systematic killing of hundreds of thousands of animals and people bears a grim reminder of the violence and cruelty that is core to the history of the Colosseum and the Roman Empire. Amazing job. Now let's continue on. And next, you're going to learn specific vocabulary that you need to know that native speakers use in our regular speech. And all of this vocabulary is at the C1 level. Let's do that now. Here's number one, a fiasco. This is a noun and it means a complete failure or collapse. Now you describe something as a fiasco. For example, you could say the conference was a complete fiasco. So a complete failure. It means the exact same thing, but side by side, failure is more of a beginner word. It's an everyday word. Fiasco instantly makes you sound smarter. Number two, to revel in something. This is a phrasal verb, so pay attention to the sentence structure because you need the preposition in, to revel in something. This has an easy meaning. It simply means to really enjoy something and take pleasure in something. For example, he reveled in his new promotion. He really enjoyed his new promotion, took a lot of pleasure from it. Now, just an important note. Don't confuse the pronunciation with the very common word reveal. We're talking about revel, revel, reveal, revel. Notice the difference in the vowel sound. This is a short sound, oh, revel, long sound, reveal. He reveled in his promotion. Number three, to anticipate. This is a verb. And it's used when something is likely or probable. So I could say, we're not anticipating any problems tonight. So it's simply saying we're not expecting. Problems are not likely or probable. Now remember, this is a verb, so notice the verb tense. We're not anticipating any problems tonight. This is in the present continuous. It's simply negative, but in the present continuous. Number four, to exaggerate. This is when you make something seem larger, more important, better, or even worse than it actually is. A lot of people do this with their problems. They might have a problem that's like this, but then they exaggerate it and they make the problem sound like it's this. They exaggerate. Another example, I could say, that was the best meal I've ever had. I'm not exaggerating. So notice, I'm using this in the negative to say, I'm not making it better than it actually is. It is that good in reality. Now we can use this with any adjective. That was the worst meal, the most expensive meal, the most unique meal, the spiciest meal. I'm not exaggerating. Number five, to indicate. 
This is a verb, and this is when you make something clear or you simply show something. We use this a lot in research studies and reports. For example, the study indicated that the cost of gold is increasing. So this is just a smarter way to say the study showed that the cost of gold is increasing. Number six, inevitable. That's a fun word to say, inevitable, inevitable. This is an adjective and it's when something is certain to happen. So 99.9% .9 going to happen. Now we generally use this with negative outcomes. If you keep eating fast food, a heart attack is inevitable. Number seven, to intend. This is a verb and it's used when you have a plan or a purpose. We commonly use this in the negative to say we don't have a plan or purpose. For example, I could say, I didn't intend to hurt your feelings. That wasn't my plan, that wasn't my purpose. I didn't intend to hurt your feelings. Now you can definitely use this in the positive, for example, we're talking about C1 vocabulary. This video is intended for advanced students. Number eight, mistaken. This is an adjective and it's when you're simply wrong. You're wrong in opinion or judgment. So I could say, I thought the conference started at nine, but I was wrong. You can say that. Or why not sound smarter and say, I thought the conference started at nine, but I was mistaken. So just that one small change will instantly make you sound smarter. Number nine, noticeable. This is an adjective, is when something is easy to see or recognize. For example, I could say there's an improvement in your speaking skills. Now, improvement is our noun, so I can modify our noun with our adjective noticeable and say there's a noticeable improvement in your speaking skills. It makes your sentence more complex and it makes the improvement sound better because it's easy to see or recognize. Number 10, substantial. This is an adjective. This means large in size, value, or worth. For example, her promotion was substantial. It was large in value or in worth. Ka-ching! Number 11, to absorb. You need this one because when you absorb information, it means you understand it fully. So when you start a new job, you might say there's so much information to absorb. So you have to get the information, but then you also have to understand it fully. So hopefully you're absorbing all of these new words. Number 12, to compel. This is a verb. It means to force someone to do something. For example, he was compelled to wear a suit to work. This means he didn't want to wear a suit. Somebody, most likely his boss or the company as a whole, forced him. They compelled him to wear a suit. Number 13, drastically. This is an adverb. It modifies a verb. And when something happens drastically, it's in a severe and sudden way. For example, everyone's daily routine was drastically changed in 2020, we went from going out every day to staying home every day. Our routines changed drastically. Number 14, excessive. This is an adjective and it means too much. The amount of sugar in processed foods is excessive. It's too much. And finally, to generalize, this is a verb. And it is used when you say that something is true all the time, when in reality, it isn't. It's only true some of the time, perhaps. For example, many people say that Canada is cold all the time. You can't generalize about the climate in Canada. We have a very diverse climate. It can get really hot, 
and it can also get really cold. You're doing a great job. Let's continue. Next, you're going to learn advanced C1 adjectives. You can use these adjectives to replace your basic level adjectives. So you can sound a lot smarter by using these C1 adjectives. And you're going to learn 100 of the most common C1 adjectives. Let's do that now. First, let's talk about sentence structure. Commonly, you can use to be plus adjective. Janice is nice. Of course, you need to conjugate your verb according to the subject. I am nice. Another common structure is to use adjective plus noun. I met a nice person. Notice the adjective comes directly before the noun, so it's article, adjective, noun. I met a nice person. Pay attention to this sentence structure. I'll also teach you more advanced sentence structures in the different examples. Now let's get started with our 100 advanced adjectives starting from A all the way to Z. Adaptable, adaptable. This is when you're willing and able to change to suit different conditions. So let's say one minute you're editing a report, next you're leading a presentation, next you're analyzing financial information. So you're working and changing to do many different things. I'm very adaptable. Adapt, adapt. You're adept at something, notice that preposition at. When you're adept at something, it means you're skilled at something. You're very good at something. I'm very adept at using SAP. Adventurous, adventurous. This is when you're willing to try new or different things. A job posting might say, we're looking for someone who's adventurous because this position requires traveling all over the world. So if you're adventurous, you can apply. Affectionate, affectionate. This is showing feelings of liking or love. She gave me an, an affectionate farewell. So a very loving farewell. I've summarized all 100 adjectives into a free lesson PDF that includes the adjective, the definition, and an example sentence. You can look in the description for the link to download the free lesson PDF. Ambitious, ambitious. This is when you have a strong desire to become successful in your career or in life. I'm attracted to ambitious men. Does that describe you? Are you ambitious? Artistic, artistic. This is when you're able to create or enjoy art. Would you describe yourself as artistic? Assertive, assertive. When you're assertive, it means you're confident saying what you mean or what you feel without fear. I need to work on being more assertive. I need to work on saying what I want, saying what I feel without being afraid of what other people might think of me. I need to work on being more assertive. Attentive, attentive. When you're attentive, it means you're very helpful and you take care of others. I try to be very attentive to my students, which means I try to be very helpful. Authentic, authentic. This means that you're real, you're true. You're not pretending to be someone that you're not, you're authentic. Sometimes being authentic around others is difficult. Sometimes being the real you is difficult because you're afraid that people might judge you. Approachable, approachable. This describes someone who is friendly and easy to talk to. My goal is for all my students to describe me as approachable. Would you describe me as approachable, friendly, and easy to talk to? If so, put that in the comments. Jennifer, you're approachable. Balanced, balanced. 
This is when you consider all sides or opinions equally. Even though she's a Democrat, she's very balanced. She considers other sides and opinions other than Democratic opinions. Bright, bright. This is another way of saying smart or intelligent or someone who learns quickly. My students are all very bright. I know you'll learn these adjectives very quickly because you're bright. Broad-minded, broad-minded. This is someone who is willing to accept different behaviors, different opinions, different lifestyles. Being broad-minded is important when you work with people from around the world. Candid, candid. When someone is candid, it means that they're honest and they tell the truth about a situation. To be candid, I left my job because I didn't like my boss. Cheerful. This is someone who is happy and positive. Cheerful. I try to surround myself with cheerful people. Chill. Chill. This is an informal adjective but commonly used and it describes someone who is relaxed, who isn't worried, isn't anxious, who's very chill. As I get older, I become more and more chill more relaxed. I don't stress as much. I'm not as anxious or worried. I'm chill. Are you chill? Put that in the comments if you are. I'm chill. Clever. Clever. This is another advanced way of saying smart or intelligent. Someone who learns quickly. She's a very clever student. Communicative. Communicative. This describes someone who is willing to talk to others and who is willing to share information. Did you notice that Julie wasn't very communicative at the meeting today? Compassionate, compassionate. This is someone who is very sympathetic to others, especially when others are in a difficult situation and they want to help that person. They're very compassionate. She's a compassionate reporter. Competitive, competitive. This describes someone who really wants to win and who enjoys competition. I am very competitive. Sometimes I'm a little too competitive because I love winning. What about you? Are you competitive? Charismatic, charismatic. This is someone who is well-liked and well-admired. And because of that, they're able to influence others easily. If you want to win the election, you need to be more charismatic. Consider it, consider it. This is when you care about and respect others. It was very considerate of you to change the meeting because you knew I had an appointment. Constructive, constructive. This is usually information or advice that's meant to help someone or help someone improve their performance. Can I give you some constructive criticism? Can I criticize you, but in a way that's meant to help you improve, help you improve your performance? Can I give you some constructive criticism? Coy, coy. When someone's coy, they intentionally don't reveal information because they want to make that information more engaging or interesting. She's being very coy about the party. So she's not sharing a lot of details about the party, but that makes you wonder about the party and want to know more. So it makes you interested in the party. She's being very coy about the party. Courageous, courageous. Someone who's courageous is able to control their fear or negative emotion in fearful or dangerous situations. It was very courageous of you to quit your job and go back to school in your 40s. Creative, creative. This is someone who produces or uses unique or original ideas. We're looking for someone who's creative. Curious, curious. 
This is someone who is interested in learning about the world around them. Being curious is a great quality when you're learning a language. Would you agree with that? If you agree, put I agree in the comments. Dependable, dependable. This is someone deserving of trust and confidence. My assistant is very dependable. Determined, determined. When you're determined, you want something really badly and you're not willing to let anything or anyone stop you from getting the thing that you want. If you're determined, you'll become fluent. That's my promise to you. But it takes determination. You need to be determined. Direct. Direct. When someone's direct, it means they communicate in a way that says exactly what they mean in a very honest way without worrying about being judged or hurting someone's feelings. I like how our CEO is very direct even when delivering bad news. Dynamic. Dynamic. This is someone who has a lot of different ideas and who is very energetic and forceful. Has anyone ever told you that you're very dynamic? Easy going, easy going. This describes someone who is relaxed and who doesn't easily get upset. My new manager is way more easy going than my last one. Eclectic, eclectic. When something is eclectic, it consists of many different types, methods, or styles. I work with an eclectic group of students in the Finally Fluent Academy. So I work with many different types of students in the Finally Fluent Academy. Emotional, emotional. This is when you have and express strong feelings and emotions. John became very emotional at his retirement party. Energetic, energetic. This is when you have a lot of energy. Even though she's almost 80, my grandmother is very energetic. Enthusiastic, enthusiastic. This is when you have an interest in a particular subject and you're very eager to want to be part of that subject. I love how enthusiastic you are about our new plan. Extroverted, extroverted. This describes a person who enjoys being with other people and are very energetic when they're with other people. Although I'm not very extroverted, I love working in sales. Exuberant, exuberant. This describes someone who is very energetic and simply happy to be alive. She's an exuberant speaker, fearless. Fearless. Of course, this means you're free from fear. Good negotiators need to be fearless. Flexible. Flexible. This is when you're able to change or be changed based on the situation. My schedule is very flexible next week. Forgiving. Forgiving. This describes someone who forgives easily. I'm thankful I have a forgiving boss a boss who forgives easily. Fruitful, fruitful. This is something that produces good results. He had a fruitful career as a lawyer. So it says he was very successful in his career. He produced good results. Frank, Frank. This describes someone who is honest and sincere. Thank you for being frank with me. Now remember that Frank is the name of a man, so you could possibly say Frank is very Frank. So a man whose name is Frank is very Frank, which means he's very honest and sincere. Fun loving, fun loving. This is when you enjoy having fun and not being too serious. Although I'm the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, I'm also very fun-loving. Gregarious, gregarious. This is someone who likes being with other people. Being gregarious is an important quality of a nurse because if you're a nurse, you need to like being around other people and spending time with your patients. Genuine, genuine. 
This describes someone who is real and exactly what they appear to be. Her speech was genuine, honorable, honorable. Notice that silent H, honorable. This is someone who's honest, silent H, honest and fair. She's an honorable boss and I respect her decision. Humble, humble. This is someone who's modest, who shows a low estimate of their own worth. Although she makes $2 million a year, she's very humble. So this means she doesn't act like she makes $2 million a year. She drives a regular car, lives in a regular house, wears regular clothes. She's humble. Handy, handy. Someone who is handy means they're really skilled with using their hands, especially when it comes to tools and repairing, fixing, or even making things. I am not very handy, which means I'm not very good at repairing or fixing things or making things using tools with my hands. What about you? Would you describe yourself as handy? Are you handy? Imaginative imaginative. This is someone who can easily think of new, creative, original, innovative ideas. Kamal is an imaginative designer. Inquisitive, inquisitive. This describes someone who wants to know about a lot of different things. Usually someone who's inquisitive asks a lot of questions. I love when my students are inquisitive about my lessons. So I love when my students ask questions. Impeccable, impeccable. This is something that is perfect, that has no mistakes, no errors, no flaws. Sylvia gave an impeccable performance. Intuitive, intuitive. When someone's intuitive, it means they can understand things but more based on emotions and feelings rather than facts or information. I'm very intuitive when it comes to hiring, which means when I hire someone, I trust the feeling I get about that person rather than the facts on their resume. So they might have this amazing resume, but when I'm talking to them, if I don't get a good feeling about that person, I'm not going to hire them, which means I'm very intuitive. I trust my intuition. I'm very intuitive. Ingenious, ingenious. This is very intelligent or skillful. The way you handled that situation was ingenious. Inviting, inviting. Someone who's inviting makes you feel very welcome in any new environment or situation. The new HR manager is very inviting. Jubilant, jubilant. This is feeling and expressing great happiness, usually because of a success. The fans were jubilant after the game. So they were very happy, which means the team won. The fans were jubilant. Keen, keen. This describes someone who is very willing and eager and wants something. She's very keen. She's already followed up with me. So maybe we had an interview yesterday and she already sent me an email asking if I needed to know anything else about her. She's very keen. Kind-hearted, kind-hearted. This is someone who really enjoys helping other people. My doctor is very kind-hearted. Lively, lively. This is someone who's full of energy and enthusiasm. My team is so lively today. Logical, logical. This means reasonable based on good judgment. You made a logical decision. Loyal, loyal. This is someone who provides support in any situation. Kirk is our most loyal manager. He's been with the company for 20 years. Laudable, laudable. This is something that deserves praise even though there was no success or little success. Your actions are laudable. So even though you didn't succeed or get the result you wanted, you still deserve praise 
most likely because you acted in a very responsible way. Mature, mature. When someone's mature, it means they act in a way that's very well developed emotionally. Although Chirac is only an intern, he's very mature. So this suggests he acts in a way that makes him seem older because he's more well developed emotionally compared to his age. Meticulous, meticulous. This means very careful with close attention to detail. As a quality assurance professional, I need to be meticulous. Marvelous, marvelous. This is another way of saying very good, marvelous. They did a marvelous job for the new client. Nimble, nimble. This is someone who is quick and exact with either their movements or their thoughts. His nimble hands are perfect for repairing antiques. Antiques are very delicate, but he can move his hands in a very quick way. His hands are very nimble. Open-minded, open-minded. This describes someone who is willing to consider ideas or opinions that are different from their own. Doctors are becoming more and more open-minded. Optimistic, optimistic. This describes someone who is hopeful, who sees the good parts of a situation, or who believes that good will come from a situation. I'm optimistic that I'll pass my oral exam. I'm hopeful out of this world out of this world this is something that's extraordinary superb your design skills are out of this world outgoing outgoing this is someone who is friendly and energetic and finds it easy and enjoyable being with other people now that i feel confident with my english i'm more outgoing at work this is something a lot of students want to have. So definitely improve your English so you can be more outgoing. Pensive, pensive. When someone is pensive, it means they're thinking and they're usually quite quiet. They're thinking very seriously, they're pensive. Julie was very pensive during our presentation, which means she was quite quiet during the presentation and she was just thinking. Proactive, proactive. This means that you take action to change something rather than waiting for the situation to happen and then simply reacting to the situation. One of my best qualities is that I'm proactive. Perceptive, perceptive. This means that you're very good at noticing details and information that other people may not notice. We really appreciate your perceptive comments. So you provided information that nobody else thought of, but you were very perceptive. We appreciate your perceptive comments. Persistent, persistent. This is when you continue doing something in a determined way even when you face difficulties or challenges. When I'm solving a problem, I'm very persistent. Punctual, punctual. This means you arrive or you do something at the scheduled time, so it means not late. Thankfully, the contractors are very punctual. They say they'll be here at 9 a.m. and 9 a.m they're here they're very punctual qualified qualified this is when you have the skill the knowledge or the ability to do something specific ronnie is the most qualified accountant i know riveting riveting this means extremely interesting the speakers at the conference were all riveting renowned renowned this means you're famous for something specific. Maya Angelou is a renowned poet. So she's famous, but for something specific, poetry. She's a renowned poet. Ravishing, ravishing. This means extremely beautiful. You look ravishing in that dress. 
or if you're a male, you look ravishing in that suit. Reverent, reverent. This is showing great respect or admiration. The reverent crowd became silent when she appeared on stage. So to show their respect and admiration, the crowd became silent. So we can say they're a reverent crowd. Self-reliant, self-reliant. This means that you rely on your own skills and abilities. When you work remotely, you need to be self-reliant. Sensible, sensible. This means having and using good judgment. I like working with Hamid. He's very sensible. Savvy, savvy. This means you have practical knowledge and skills. She's very savvy when it comes to marketing. And I'm sure you're familiar with the term tech savvy, which means you're very skilled and knowledgeable when it comes to technology, tech savvy. I'm very tech savvy. What about you? Are you tech savvy? Put that in the comments. I'm tech savvy. I'm not tech savvy. Supportive, supportive. This is giving encouragement and approval. As a teacher, I try to be very supportive to all my students. Sincere, sincere. This means honest, not false, not invented. Her apology was sincere. So she said, I'm sorry, and she said it in an honest way, not I'm sorry, where clearly she's not actually sorry. I'm sorry. Her apology was sincere. Straightforward straightforward. This means honest and not hiding one's opinions. I love how straightforward Shirley is. Sage, sage. This means wise and we use it specifically with people who are wise because they're old and with their old age they gain wisdom. They're very sage. The consultant has 20 years of experience, so we can trust his sage advice. Steadfast, steadfast. This means staying the same for a long time, not changing, not losing purpose. Jose is a steadfast assistant. Tenacious, tenacious. This is when you're unwilling to accept defeat, or unwilling to stop doing or having something. Felicity is a tenacious student. Thrilling, thrilling. This means very exciting. Fabio's plan for the company is thrilling. Tender, tender. This means gentle, loving, or kind. It's important to be tender when you're delivering bad news. Tactful, tactful. This is when you're careful not to say or do something that could upset others. Yusuf quit in a very tactful way. Upbeat, upbeat. This means positive with hope for the future. Marie is very upbeat about the proposal. Unrelenting, I like this one, unrelenting. This means extremely determined, never weakening or ending. I appreciate my parents' unrelenting support. Their support never weakens. It never ends. It's unrelenting. Versatile, versatile. This is when you're able to change easily from one activity to another or when you can use one thing in many different ways. Brad Pitt is a versatile actor, so he's one actor but you can use him in many different ways. Romance, comedy, action, drama. He's a versatile actor. Vibrant, vibrant. This means energetic, exciting, and full of enthusiasm. I love how vibrant my work environment is. Witty, witty. When someone's witty, it means they're funny, but in a very intelligent way. My pilot was very witty. Youthful, youthful. This means having qualities that are typical of young people. Her youthful enthusiasm makes coming to work more enjoyable. So maybe she isn't youthful, 
Maybe she is 50 or 60 years old, but her enthusiasm, her energy is youthful, which is a very positive thing. So it's more enjoyable coming to work. Zealous, zealous. This means enthusiastic and eager. I appreciate how zealous she is. Amazing job. Think of all the C1 vocabulary you've already learned and you're not done yet. Let's move on and learn the most common C1 verbs, adverbs, nouns, and adjectives. Let's do that now. And you'll complete quizzes after each section. In this lesson, you're going to learn the most common C1 verbs, adverbs, nouns, and adjectives. And you're going to complete quizzes after each section. All the vocabulary is at the C1 level. The C1 level is an advanced level of English proficiency. Students at this level are expected to have a wide range of vocabulary and use complex language structures. Now let's start with the top 10 C1 verbs. To advocate, advocate. This means that you support, recommend, or speak in favor of something. For sentence structure, you advocate for something. You need that preposition for, and then you have your something, a noun, or a gerund verb because you have the preposition for. As an example, environmentalists advocate for stricter regulations to protect endangered species. If the environmentalists advocate for these stricter regulations, it means they want them, they recommend them, they support them, and they speak in favor of them. And notice that preposition for. Environmentalists advocate for stricter regulations. To elaborate, elaborate. This is when you add more detail or information to a statement or explanation. For sentence structure, you elaborate on something, and that something is your idea, your statement, your explanation. So notice that preposition, here we need on. Advocate for, elaborate on. For example, the professor asks Mark, to elaborate on his research findings during the presentation. So Mark is presenting, he's sharing information about his research findings. But the professor said, can you elaborate on this? So Mark needs to provide more information, more details. And by doing so, he's elaborating on his research findings to implement, implement. This is when you put something into effect or action, or you apply or carry out a plan or decision. For example, the company plans to implement a new marketing strategy to increase sales. So they're going to implement this marketing strategy. They're going to put it into effect. Once it's in effect, it means it is active, it is doing what you wanted it to do. And notice here, you implement something. So we don't need an additional preposition between our verb and our noun or clause. Implement the marketing plan, implement the strategy, implement the recommendations. To emerge, emerge. This is when something comes into existence or becomes visible or apparent. For example, as the sun set, the city's skyline emerged in all its splendor. The city skyline emerged. It became visible or apparent. Apparent is another way of saying visible. If something is apparent, it means you can see it. A problem can also emerge, which means that problem is visible or apparent. To constitute, 
constitute. This means to be part of a whole or to form or make up something. For example, these five sections constitute the annual report. So these five sections make up the annual report. They form the annual report. They're a part of the annual report. So the sections are the individual parts and the whole is the annual report. And these five sections constitute, make up or form the annual report. To commence, commence. This simply means to begin or start something. Remember that all of these verbs are advanced C1 verbs. They are more advanced ways of saying simple things like start, commence. But also remember that to be considered fluent and advanced in English, you need to know these alternative ways and advanced grammatical structures. So commence is the advanced way of saying to start or begin. For example, the conference will commence with a keynote speech by a renowned expert in the field. Of course, you can simply say start, but to sound more advanced, you can say commence. To encompass, encompass. This means to include or contain or to cover or surround entirely. For example, the project scope encompasses a wide range of topics related to sustainable development. If it encompasses a wide range of topics related to sustainable development, it means that it includes or contains these topics. And the project scope, the scope of a project is what a project will include or cover. So if it is within the scope, the project will do it. If an item is outside of the scope, well then the project will not do it. You might need to commence, start a new project that encompasses that other item, that contains that other item. To complement, complement. This means to enhance or complete something by adding an additional item that harmonizes with it. In plain English, it means that you add something that goes well with it, that matches it. For example, the red shoes complemented her black dress perfectly. She has her black dress. Well, what color harmonizes with black? What color goes well with black? Red. Red and black complement each other. So she chose red shoes to complement her black dress. To convey. Convey. This means to communicate or express a message or information. For example, the artist used muted colors to convey a sense of tranquility in the painting. The artist used these colors to convey a certain emotion, to communicate that emotion, to express that emotion. Muted colors are very soft colors. Tranquility, that is a feeling of calm. So when you look at this painting, the feeling is conveyed. The feeling is communicated or expressed. To assemble, assemble. This means to gather or to put together parts to create a whole. For example, tomorrow let's assemble in the conference room to discuss the proposal. In this sense, it means to gather. So when individuals assemble, first they're individuals, but then the whole is the team. So you have the individual members, but then when they assemble, they combine to form the team. And it can also mean to gather. When people gather, they are individuals and they come together as a whole. 
Tomorrow, let's assemble in the conference room to discuss the proposal. So now you have the 10 most common C1 verbs in the English language to help you get to that advanced level in English. But how well do you really know these verbs? Well, let's find out with a quiz. Here are the questions. Hit pause, take as much time as you need, and when you're ready to see the answers, hit play. So how did you do with that quiz? Let's find out. Here are the answers. Hit pause, take as much time as you need to review these answers, and when you're done, hit play. Amazing job with that section. Make sure you share your score in the comments below and also share your favorite advanced verb from the list in the comments and leave an example sentence. And now let's move on to the top 10 C1 adverbs. Now before we start, just remember that adverbs can modify verbs, adjectives, and other adverbs. Adverbs are there to add more detail, more clarity, or to emphasize the word used in the sentence. Adverbs are easy to identify in a sentence because they're commonly formed by adding ly to the adjective. With that, let's review the top 10 C1 adverbs. Incessantly incessantly. This means without interruption or continuously. For example, the alarm kept ringing incessantly until she finally woke up. Of course, I could say the alarm kept ringing until she finally woke up. Adverbs are not required in a sentence. But when I say incessantly, you have this picture in your mind of this action happening non-stop continuously. So all of a sudden, it sounds a lot more annoying or frustrating than without the adverb. The alarm kept ringing incessantly until she finally woke up. Inevitably, inevitably. That's fun to say, inevitably. This means certain to happen. So let's take an example with population growth. I could say, with the increasing population, traffic jams are inevitably becoming more common. Again, I could simply say traffic jams are becoming more common, but when I add inevitably, it emphasizes that and you know that this is definitely going to happen. This is certain to happen. And of course, a traffic jam is when you are unable to move because there are cars all around you. A traffic jam, something that we inevitably deal with. Inordinately, inordinately. This means excessively or unusually. For example, he was inordinately excited about his art exhibition. Of course, you expect someone to be excited about their art expedition or any sort of event or presentation. But if you say he was inordinately excited, all of a sudden, I don't think this is a good thing because it means there is too much excitement. The amount of excitement is not appropriate to the situation. So this is how adverbs are so valuable because they can really change the overall meaning of a sentence. He was inordinately excited about his upcoming art exhibition. And maybe you were inordinately upset about making a mistake in English. It's normal to make mistakes, but the amount of upset that you became was too much given the situation. Magnanimously, magnanimously. That's a long word, magnanimously. This means in a generous 
and forgiving way. For example, my old boss was magnanimously friendly after he found out I started my own company. So I was working for this company, but then I quit, I left, and I started my own company that's going to compete directly with the existing company. So you would expect that my boss, my previous boss, my old boss would be upset, but he was friendly. So I can say magnanimously friendly to show that he was friendly in a forgiving way. He wanted to show that he wasn't upset because I left and started my own company. Ostensibly, ostensibly. This means appearing as one thing when it is really something else. For example, he was ostensibly happy. So I know that he's appearing happy, but there's really something else. So in reality, he isn't happy. I know that because I said ostensibly happy. He was ostensibly happy about the news, but deep down, he was really worried. So he appeared happy, but in reality, he's worried. Deep down, that represents the feelings on the inside that we generally don't show to the public. Perpetually, perpetually. This means constantly or continuously over a long period of time. For example, she's perpetually late. This is not a good thing because if you said she's late, well, that simply means she's late right now in this specific situation. But if I add the adverb perpetually, I know it means constantly, which is all the time. It's a reoccurring action or continuously over a long period of time. She's perpetually late. Not a good thing. Precariously, precariously. This means dangerously or in an unstable way. For example, the hiker walked precariously along the edge of the cliff. So there's an edge of a cliff. That's already a dangerous situation. But if he's walking precariously, it means he's walking in an unstable way. So he's walking like this or a dangerous way. He's extremely close to the edge of the cliff superfluously. This is also fun to say, superfluously. This means in an unnecessary or excessive manner. So too much, too much beyond what is needed. For example, the report was superfluously long. So reports can be long, but if you say it was superfluously long, it means unnecessarily long. They made one section of the report 10 pages when it could have easily been one page. So hopefully you don't think that this video is superfluously long, excessively long, too long than needed, wanted, or desired unanimously, unanimously. This means with complete agreement of all parties involved. So everyone agrees with the same thing. They all agree yes, or they all agree no, or they all agree some other decision. For example, the board members unanimously approved the annual report. This means that every board member said, yes, I approve. They unanimously approved. Vehemently, vehemently. This means in a strong and emotional way. For example, she vehemently opposed the idea of relocating to a new city. When you relocate, it means you permanently move from where you live now to a different location. So she opposed this idea. She didn't want to relocate. 
But if I say she vehemently opposed, you know it was with strong emotion. She feels very strongly that she doesn't want to move, to relocate. She vehemently opposed relocating to a new city. So now you have 10 advanced adverbs in your vocabulary to help you sound fluent and advanced at that C1 level. So let's find out how well you know these adverbs with a quiz. Here are the questions. Hit pause, take as much time as you need, and when you're ready to see the answers, hit play. So how'd you do with that quiz? Well, let's find out. Here are the answers. Hit pause, review them, and when you're ready to move on, hit play. You're doing great. Make sure you share your score, and again, share your favorite adverb, leave an example sentence, and let's move on to the top 10 most common C1 nouns. Disparity, disparity. This is a noticeable difference or inequality between things, often in terms of quantity, quality, or status. For example, there is a significant disparity in income levels between the rich and poor in this city. Remember grammatically that we're talking about nouns. So pay attention to if the noun requires an article or if not, because it's either an exception or it's uncountable. In this case, we have a disparity. We need an article. There's a modifier, a significant disparity. The article is conjugated with the modifier. So if you need a or an, it depends on what directly comes after the article a significant disparity. Resilience, resilience. This is a concept and it's when you can recover quickly from challenges or difficulties. For example, the community's resilience was evident in how quickly they rebuilt after the devastating earthquake. So there was this devastating earthquake that destroyed the homes but the city's resilience, their ability to recover quickly from challenges or difficulties allowed them to rebuild the home. And notice that the resilience, it belongs to the city, the city's resilience. Dilemma, dilemma, that's fun to say, dilemma. This is a difficult situation or problem where a choice must be made between two options, but they're equally undesirable. So both of the options aren't very good, but you have to make a decision. That's a dilemma. And notice that article, a dilemma. For example, she faced a dilemma between taking a high paying job she didn't enjoy or pursuing her passion for art, but with an uncertain income. So she can take the high paying job, but she doesn't like it. Or she can pursue art, but there's no money. So that's a dilemma, because both of those options have undesirable qualities. Endeavor, endeavor. This is a serious or determined effort to achieve something especially something challenging or worthwhile. For example, the team made every endeavor to complete the project ahead of schedule. Notice here, because it's a noun, we sometimes require other grammatical structures to make it complete. And here you make an endeavor. Otherwise, we could actually use endeavor as a verb the team endeavored to complete the project. But this lesson is teaching you nouns. And in this case, endeavor is also a noun, but you make an endeavor. In this example, it's made every endeavor 
So we have our verb make in the past simple, and because every implies there was more than one, we don't have an article. Made every endeavor, but endeavor is a noun that doesn't take a plural form. So the noun is plural, but we don't add an s to it. Inclination, inclination. This is a natural tendency or preference towards something. His inclination towards music led him to pursue a career as a professional musician. So he has a natural tendency towards music. Or simply, he has a preference, and because of that preference, he's pursuing a career as a musician. His inclination, and notice the inclination belongs to him. His inclination towards music. Catalyst, catalyst. A catalyst is something that speeds up a significant change, or that causes a significant change. For example, the new technology served as a catalyst for the company's rapid expansion into international markets. So in this case, the catalyst is the new technology, and the new technology allowed the company to speed up a significant change. Which in this case is expanding into international markets, or it simply caused that significant change. So either they were in the process of doing this, or they started it as a new project. But the new technology was the catalyst. It sped it up, or it caused it. Disposition. Disposition. This is a person's inherent qualities of mind and character, or you can think of it as one's temperament or nature. For example, her cheerful disposition made her a joy to be around, even in difficult situations. So here, her disposition. Disposition is the noun, and it simply represents her character, her personality. And then we have an adjective: her cheerful disposition. And in that case, it sounds like a positive disposition. But somebody could have a negative disposition. His angry disposition made him a negative person to be around. To completely change the example to the opposite. Connotation. Connotation. This is the emotional or cultural associations that a word has beyond its literal meaning. So let's take the word home. Literally, a home is where you live. That's the literal meaning. But what other connotations are there with the word home? We could say the word home has positive connotations of warmth and security. So that's the emotional characteristics that the word has beyond its literal meaning. That's the connotation. Controversy. Controversy. I'm sure you know this one. This is a prolonged public dispute or debate, often involving opposing views or conflicting opinions. For example, the new government policy sparked a controversy among citizens and politicians alike. Sparked a controversy. Here, the word spark. Simply means created. The controversy only exists because of this new policy. And remember, the controversy is that there are opposing views, conflicting ideas. So there's going to be some sort of debate, and is going to be a prolonged debate, a longer than usual debate because it's a controversy. Inference. Inference. This is a conclusion reached based on evidence and reasoning rather than direct observation. So I could look at something and reach a conclusion. 
That's direct observation. But maybe I don't have the advantage of looking at something. So I have to use evidence and reasoning to reach that conclusion. That's inference. This is something that detectives do because detectives don't always get to simply look at something to directly observe it. For example, from the clues provided, so the clues, that's the reasoning and the evidence. From the clues provided, the detective made a crucial inference about the suspect's location. So the detective reached a conclusion about the suspect's location, not based on observation, because if you could observe where a suspect is, well then you would know exactly where that person is. But the detective didn't know. He had to use inference, the clues to determine that. So now you know the top 10 C1 nouns. But how well do you truly know these nouns? Let's find out with a quiz. So here are the questions. Hit pause, take as much time as you need, and when you're ready to see the answers, hit play. So how do you do with that quiz? Well, let's find out. Here are the answers. Hit pause, take as much time as you need to review the answers, and when you're ready to continue, hit play. You're doing such a great job. Share your score, leave your favorite noun with an example sentence, and finally, let's move on to the top 10 C1 adjectives. An adjective modifies a noun or a pronoun. It provides additional information about the noun or the pronoun, such as the size, color, shape, quantity, or quality. Ultimately, adjectives help make the sentence more descriptive and interesting, and they'll help you sound very fluent and advanced in English. So let's get started with the 10 most common C1 adjectives. Ubiquitous, ubiquitous. This means present, found, or appearing everywhere. For example, smartphones are ubiquitous devices. They're found everywhere. They're found in every home, every office. So we can say smartphones are ubiquitous devices in every home and office. Paramount, paramount. When something is paramount, it means it's more important than anything else. In emergency situations, the safety of the passengers is paramount to the airline crew. So you know the safety of the passengers is important to the airline crew, but by including the adjective paramount, you know it's more important than anything else. So the safety of the passengers is more important than protecting the actual airplane. The safety of the passengers is paramount. Vast, vast. This means a very great extent or quantity. So when I hear vast, I know that the extent is very great. For example, the Sahara Desert is a vast expanse of sand dunes. So of course I know there are sand dunes in the desert. I know there are many sand dunes, but when I hear vast, the image I have in my mind all of a sudden changes and I see sand dune after sand dune after sand dune because it's vast. Profound, profound. This means having deep insight or understanding. For example, the professor's lecture on quantum mechanics was profound. By using this adjective, I understand that the person saying this learned a lot of very deep insights or now has a very deep understanding of the topic because it was profound. Pervasive, pervasive. 
This means spreading widely throughout a group or an area. Remember, we talked about how smartphones are ubiquitous. They appear everywhere. Well, as a result, we can say that social media is a pervasive part of modern society. Because smartphones are ubiquitous and social media, like the J4's English YouTube channel, is now everywhere as well. So it's pervasive. It is spread widely and spread quickly within society. Inherent. Inherent. This means existing in something as a permanent or inseparable quality or element. For example, cats have an inherent ability to land on their feet when they fall. Have you heard that before? That when a cat falls, it always lands on its feet. Well, this is an inherent quality. It's permanent within the cat. It's not separable from the cat. The cat didn't learn how to do this. It's just an inherent quality. Inquisitive. Inquisitive. This means showing a strong curiosity or willingness to learn. For example, my daughter was very inquisitive when we were at the museum. Generally, someone displays being inquisitive by asking a lot of questions. So if you're at the museum with a young child or even an adult, and they ask a lot of questions about what they're seeing. They could also be inquisitive by wanting to read all of the signs and the posters and the information about the objects that they're looking at at the museum. In my opinion, being inquisitive is a very beneficial quality when you're learning, especially when you're learning a language. I love when my students ask questions when they're inquisitive because it shows they're really trying to understand. And when you ask questions and you get those answers, you're able to form those connections in your brain and learn faster as well. So hopefully you are inquisitive when it comes to the English language. Fickle. Fickle, that's fun to say, fickle. This means changing frequently, especially in one's loyalties, interests, or affections. For example, the fashion industry is known for its fickle trends. Trends in the fashion industry change very quickly, very frequently. One day, it could be very fashionable to wear a sweater like this, and then next week, they say, that is the ugliest sweater ever and you shouldn't wear it. So they're very fickle about what's trendy and what's not trendy. The fashion industry could also be fickle about which designers they promote and support. Maybe one day, this person is the designer that everyone's talking about, but then next week, nobody's talking about that person and there's a totally new designer. So the fashion industry and many other industries is very fickle. Intrinsic, intrinsic. This means belonging naturally and therefore it's an essential part. For example, an intrinsic motivation to succeed drives some athletes to push their limits. So they're not motivated by winning a trophy because that's an external motivation. The trophy is outside of them. They're motivated by something within, an intrinsic motivation. And just like I said that being inquisitive is important when you're learning a language, so is having an intrinsic motivation. If you're only motivated to study, to pass the IELTS, well, that's an external motivation. And although it's great to have that motivation, generally, it's not enough. Generally, we also need an intrinsic motivation to really push ourselves and succeed our full potential. Eminent. 
eminent. This means famous and respected within a specific profession or field. For example, she was awarded a prize for her eminent contributions to the field. The field being the area of her profession. So if she is a quantum mechanic, then that is her field. Quantum mechanics is her field. If she is a physicist, then that is her field, her area of study, interest, or profession. And here it said her eminent contributions. So it's implying that her contributions are famous or respected within that particular field, whether it be quantum mechanics or physics. Now you have the top 10 adjectives added to your vocabulary, but how well do you really know these adjectives? Let's find out with a quiz. Here are the questions. Hit pause, take as much time as you need, and when you're ready, hit play. So how'd you do with that quiz? Well, let's find out. Here are the answers. Hit pause, review them, take as much time as you need, and when you're ready to continue, hit play. So how'd you do with that quiz? Make sure you share your score in the comments and also share your favorite adjective from the list. It's hard to choose, but I would probably say for me, it's fickle because that is really fun to say. Fickle, fickle, I like that one. What about you? Share it in the comments and try an example sentence using your favorite adjective. And you can get this free speaking guide where I share six tips on how to speak English fluently and confidently. You can click here to download it or look for the link in the description. And why don't you get started with your next video right now?